Yeah, hello everyone. We are here continuing the unthinking, unlearning online lab and residency for our participants and for everyone who joined us. Uh, thank you everyone who's joining us now online. We are, I'm sitting in Moscow, it's sunny outside and the weather is quite hot. And uh, today is the last uh, day of our first section, which is, uh, which, which we thought to be describing sound as agents. So we had amazing lectures and talks from Salome Fogelin, from Vita Zelenska. Yesterday there was Pedro Oliveira. And uh, now last but not the least, of course, uh, we have our wonderful guest who joined us from Berlin. And uh, so I'm really, really glad to present to you the French-born and Berlin-based sound artist and uh, musician and uh, occasionally a radio host. So if you haven't uh, seen it yet, so there is an amazing uh, show, it's called Open Source on Kashmir Radio, on Berlin Radio Kashmir. Uh, so without further introduction, thank you for joining us. Here is Jessica Eckerman. Hi, Jessica. Hi, uh, can you see and hear me? That's fine. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> so hello, everybody. And then thank you so much for the introduction and also for inviting me today. Um, so the title of the sh this chapter of the series was, I think, Sound as Agent of Social Change. And then the announced title for my talk is uh, Sound Beyond Western Tradition. <clears throat> so in this talk, I want to introduce my own work. So speaking from my own perspective, uh, on the current critics of the long-standing assumed neutrality of technology and Western-centric discourses, and all this can be reflected in my own practice, basically. Uh, also in the text on the website, I mentioned this term, the ontological turn, and um, this term comes from a text by Mary Thompson uh, that is called Whiteness and the Ontological Turn in Sound Studies uh, from 2017. Um, I'm not going to talk about this text, but just to say that uh, I mentioned this one because it was kind of an important text uh, in the sound studies scholars world at the time uh, that was basically kind of pointing towards another path for sound studies that is kind of belonging a little bit more to cultural studies. And uh, yeah, the point basically, <clears throat> sorry, was to um, uh, but the, criticize the fact that uh, having focused for so long on trying to speak about sound in itself as maybe a scientific neutral phenomena was also a way to remove uh, the social, the cultural, the politic, and also the position of the person that is speaking. So today I'm going to present a few mostly recent works of mine. And all these questions are presented in my work, but also if we have the time, then I'll introduce a few of the figures and initiatives that they've been working with and I think are important to look at when we talk about that. Uh, and of course, also, since we are speaking of the position of the speakers, then I'm, of course, speaking from my position, which is uh, being a French born artist of uh, Cameroonian heritage that is living in Germany. So maybe some of the things I'm going to say, since I'm considering the fact that uh, a lot of this audience is Russian, uh, I guess it's meaningful for you to think about how to apply this in your own, uh, from your own perspective. Um, so the first work of mine that I want to talk about is a recent one. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna let it like this. I don't know to do a proper presentation. Anyway, so this is a work from 2021, so from the beginning of the this year. Uh, I did two works actually uh, that were for the last Mass Music Festival in Berlin, but had for the first time an online edition. I think it's no, yeah, um, and it was uh, commissioned by both the festival uh, Mass Music and also by uh, Savvy Contemporary. So maybe I can start by quickly presenting Savvy because I think they are an important institution to present in this uh, 
discourse. So this is uh, art space or a cultural space in Berlin. Uh, you will find more information about them on their website, Savvy Contemporary in Berlin. They do a lot of different events, a lot of research. They also um, have a lot of uh, publications uh, that you can, yeah, like a lot of books. And now in the new space, they also host a publishing house that could be interesting for you also, that is called Archive Books. Uh, if you go on their website, there's also a lot of their texts that are on open access. So I recommend you to have a look at all of these. And uh, Sebi also is organizing regularly a lot of talks online. They have a radio show, a lot of discussion, etc. So this is a good resource for this. Um, so the, the one part of uh, the focus of the festival and also of the project of Sevi was to focus on the work of Ali Meldab. So Ali Meldab is, uh, was an Egyptian American composer. Uh, yes, this is this person here. Uh, he was born in 1921 and he died in 2017 and uh, is known as a, among else, as an early uh, pioneer of electronic music, uh, among else, he's known for his piece that is called uh, The Expression of Tsar, that is actually uh, now recognized as the earliest known, at least, example of what is called music concrete, um, which is important to say because this is contributing to the current discussion about rethinking uh, histories, those kind of histories. Of as they were made. He also did uh, composition for acoustic instruments. Um, so for this project, uh, the people are savvy, especially Camila Metwali, that is a, uh, one of the curator of Savvy, did a lot of research, archiving, etc., to try to um, yeah, archive the different writings of uh, Halim and uh, his work. So this was really helpful for me because I really dived into the archive that they gave me to get an idea of who this person was, what his work was about, etc. And uh, an aspect of his work that is less, less, maybe less obvious or less talked about or less documented, but that drew my attention particularly and that I think make him quite uh, forward thinking is his strong interest for collectivity and labor or work in general. For example, he has this one piece called uh, Symphony for a Thousand Drums, uh, for which he did uh, open call, basically inviting musician and also non-professional musician alike to participate in a piece of him that was this uh, Symphony for a Thousand Drum. Or also, uh, he's been working a lot in the US and uh, he had this, especially this one project that was to do uh, opera. And he basically invited the staff of the university also to make this opera happen. Or, uh, um, yeah, um, so this is one example of how he was also really thinking beyond uh, aesthetics and really thinking about, I think, uh, kind of institutional structures in a way. Uh, he was also an agricultural engineer, and uh, this is quite important, I think, in his way of uh, approaching things, because talking about the rhythm of the earth, etc., is really important uh, in his discourse. And also because while he was still an agricultural engineer, this is the at this place of work that he did uh, his first sound installation, basically, is what he's writing uh, in the fields. It was a uh, some installation to drive uh, birds away from, from the fields. Um, so this led me to uh, do this installation for the exhibition at Savi that just closed about him. And this installation was called World Within Worlds. Uh, for this installation that was, um, I used Maxim SP and so it was a four channel installation and it was placed at the back of uh, the building where Savi is. So uh, in the emergency exit, in a corridor that leads to an emergency exit, you can see the emergency sign here. So normally a space that is not really kind of hidden or uh, not really used, doesn't really belong to the place of, uh, that is made for art. Um, 
And uh, what I use as uh, in my research or what is the, the starting point of this is a study that I found, uh, I'm gonna open it now, that is called finding the probabilities of door being open using a continuous position logger that was made by the Department of Civil and Natural Resource Engineering from uh, New Zealand, yeah. And I was really interested in these studies uh, because it relates to what I was introducing before. This study, what, what these studies is basically trying to do is by using a lot of statistic and a lot of heavy science, technology, et cetera, trying to uh, establish what, this is kind of a bit surrealistic when you read it like this, but what is the probability in general of doors uh, to be open? Uh, so in most of these studies is just uh, describing what the process was, etc. And then you see all the different uh, numbers that they draw from this is the kind of technology that they used. And then also a lot of, uh, yeah, photos from doors being open. And it's interesting because uh, it kind of shows how uh, it's making use of this really heavy vocabularies of neutrality, rationalization, statistics, etc. Those are the kind of results that you have in the end, which is basically always like 90% chance of uh, the door being closed, I think. And this is, uh, I mean, if you just read a little bit about statistics. This is really easy kind of uh, result. And what's interesting also in these studies, um, sorry, I need to talk more about the context. What they were trying to do is to establish this probability to try to assess um, what is the risk uh, of fire in uh, working places environment. And so they were basically surveilling worker behavior. And this is inter um, important because there is this little paragraph in these wall studies here that really kind of attracted my attention, where they say that the influence of a form of the autumn effect cannot be ruled out of the results. So what is this effect? <clears throat> the potential for human behavior to be influenced by the fact that a certain aspect is giving attention. So I'm just going to sum it up it's just that they are basically saying, we are presenting you those statistics uh, that are supposed to be neutral, et cetera, but we are not able to actually measure the social aspects of this. Um, so basically they are ruling out kind of the, the political and social economical aspects of their studies. Um, and they are also proposing here uh, that um, uh, maybe we could try to make those uh, device less visible uh, in order for the, the workers to not change uh, their behavior. And also we are citing the fact that uh, maybe the, the owner of the building could have applied pressure to those workers so to be sure that they meet those uh, safety measures, etc. And then they say it might have to be written into the building regulation of compliance requirements to be suc successfully implemented. So we might need to change the rules so we are able to do that. Um, so those are the kind of numbers that I took um, as, or that I chose to kind of sonify, uh, not to kind of, but to sonify for this installation. Uh, and the idea was to kind of bring to experience those really abstract numbers and also in the same time bring to experience the actual um, social dynamic behind because this is also what we are probably seeing in the numbers. Um, even though it makes this claim for universality, uh, universality, sorry, rationality and neutrality. Um, and the way I did this is that um, during the work cycles, I'm kind of following the structure of the, the study itself. During the work cycles, it is from eight to uh, five. Uh, I used um, the sound of the drums, so something quite energetic to accompany uh, uh, the rhythm of work. And also, drumming is something that was quite big present uh, in the coffin as I in before. 
and during non-working hours and you mostly have sine wave frequencies uh, sine waves or like the theme of frequencies in general is also something that is present in Halin's work. Um, yeah, and maybe what I can say more about this is in general, I mean, most of my work is mostly about music right now, uh, but when I do installations, uh, I tend to do to really um, not really add visual elements and really kind of be in dialogue with the place. Um, and what interests me is how oh, when you add um, sonic information to a space, how oh, can it helps you um, change perception about this space. So now I can make you hear a, uh, an extract from this. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna, uh, this is just an extract, so we're gonna hear about one minute. And what we're gonna hear now is the shift from the non-working hours of the sine waves uh, towards uh, the start of the working process, working time. Skipping a little bit through it just to hear a bit of the drums and then because we don't have all right so you have an idea of course, it's a little bit ironic to talk about sound art or to make you hear an extract from a multi-channel installation on Zoom where you probably hear mono uh, and low quality sound. But anyway, it probably gives you an idea. Um, so this was one part of the project. And uh, the other part was uh, commissioned by um, uh, Mass Music. Uh, that was called, or the work was called Music Enriched by Tradition from the Depths of Time. Um, so this was a music performance or live performance. Um, and I chose this title in reference to an article by Halim that was published in the New York Times. Uh, yeah. This one. And so in from 1964, yeah. And so in this article is describing the vernacular musical language of street musicians from Ethiopia and also a project he did with them um, trying to enter in dialogue and uh, using 20th uh, centuries techniques or so tapes, etc., electronic from electronic music. Um, and also, uh, actually, I couldn't find it again in this text, but this maybe is saying it somewhere else. But what I thought was interesting about it is that he's also talking about this intention to place them in university. And I think this is quite uh, really interesting, actually. Uh, and what kind of uh, puts him apart of shows always not only interested in the formal aspects of things, but also in the structure. Um, and also, 
uh, in these projects, uh, it, it shows that you kind of wanted to make a bridge between the Arabic world and Sub-Saharan Africa, also because of through his past, he had some link actually with Ethiopia, etc. But I thought this was an interesting kind of uh, starting point for me. Um, so the way I approached that was to uh, approach it from my own perspective, as I told you, like my origins are in Cameroon. And so this is something I explored uh, in my work also. So I was interested in applying this thinking in Cameroon in the uh, the situation of uh, people that I call that as pygmies, or they are known like this. So this is why I say this word, although they don't really like to be called like this. Uh, there's actually many different uh, peoples that are uh, called under this name. And uh, the scale I use was the scale from the Bakka people in Cameroon. And what I thought is interesting there is that uh, they are in similar positions of a street musician there. Where those kind of uh, this kind of uh, music is kind of as um, Halim is saying here, uh, not really how can I say kind of ostracized in the process of uh, um, colonization, of course, but also modernity, etc. And I thought this would be interesting in the concept of in a context of Cameroon also to introduce those people who are for, in the case of the Baka people, they are living in the forest and their way of living are kind of uh, threatened because of deforestations and they are not really well regarded by society in general, where they are kind of looked down upon. Um, so you see scale and as a starting point and I try to reflect on those kind of uh, musical vocabulary and integrate it into my, in general, musical work um, with algorithmic composition, etc. cetera. Um, maybe I can just make you hear or make you look at this. Uh, yeah. And one of the texts that inspire me is also a text from Halim that is called uh, Towards an African Pianism where it's kind of reflecting on what could be uh, a style of piano playing seen from an African perspective. So I'm going to skip in a little bit. Skip a little bit. So. I'm going to stop here and then you can just go on the website of uh, Berliner Festspieler and it's in uh, on demand 
uh, part of the website if you want to watch the whole thing. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about another project now, and then I will come back later to this question of the so-called pygmy people and why I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, so another project I wanted to talk about is this album that I released on Important Record in 2019. Um, so the concept of the album, um, or maybe I, I, I should talk about the context first. It was uh, recorded live during uh, Ars Electronica in 2018 for a sleeping event that was uh, curated by the multimedia artist Shuli Cheng and the cultural theorist Matthew Fuller. So this was, uh, and we were commissioned to uh, do a piece that lasts two hours. So it was kind of long durational. This was my starting point, this idea of sleeping, etc. So on this album, there's uh, two pieces, two long, long format pieces. Uh, one is Solid of Revolution and the other one is called not, uh, Never Order or Even. And basically those two um, pieces are the same, but different. Um, in the term that they have the same principle and they just have different scale and slightly different tempo. Um, and the, the, the starting idea is to, uh, it's, it's a basic idea of uh, phasing, um, to have a lot of different metronomes that uh, start all together and then slowly shifting. And so the, the result is that you hear something that is always the same, but always different because you hear the same set of notes, but at gens uh, or structured uh, in a different ways. So all the, the possible combination of this combination of notes can be heard. Um, and so what I was interested in is that it's not something that you can listen to as a normal concert. Actually, I was not really, but my intention was not really to be on the stage for this. And at some point, you know, like at maybe when it starts, you listen attentively, but at some point you understood what the process is. So you can kind of predict what would come after. Uh, and your way of listening is shifting. Um, and this was conceived uh, originally for quadraphonic sound as well. So the, the impression is quite different. Uh, one of the concepts I was interested in is this idea of multi-stable perception, which is, uh, can be also a sonic um, uh, phenomenon, but uh, it's mostly seen as something visual where you have an image that is the same image, but you have different ways of seeing it with different meanings. Um, I found this really interesting and also uh, I was really interested in this idea of trends. Um, and one of the reasons why especially I'm interested to work with rhythm is that I think even if you're working with concepts that can be a little bit abstract, rhythm is something that everybody understands, I think. Uh, and they understand not only with their mind, but also with their body. You know, when there's a rhythm, people tend to kind of like at least move their hands or move their body. And this bodily knowledge is something that I was interested in because um, maybe in terms of mathematics and the rhythm could be a bit complicated if you don't know anything about it, but you kind of get it anyway through your bodily experience. Um, yeah, let's listen to... Uh, Extract, let's say, from this one. Uh, this is the beginning or start. Yeah, you 
can listen online for the rest. Um, and I was talking about the so-called pygmies before I'm going to continue using that term just so that everybody know what I'm talking about. Um, and this was also something that was important for me in the, the composition and also today when I compose in general, uh, I always tend to think about uh, in terms of different voices. And I think this is really interesting musical form. Um, also because it's actually a form of music that is not, uh, it's not about representation or giving a concert. It's uh, really a social practice that everybody is taking part in, whether you're young or you're older, you don't need to be a professional musician or something like this. And it accompanies the rhythm of daily life. This was the bridge here with the fact of people that were sleeping in a room, maybe going in, going out, etc. cetera. Um, and what also, uh, I wanted to say more about this music uh, of the Pygmies is um, one of the inspiration also in here was uh, the piece of Ligeti that was the metronome piece. Uh, and it's someone that has been inspired by the music of the Pygmies and many of the different composers, uh, European composers have been using in general um, music from Africa uh, in their work and in general the, the, they engaged in a more um, formalistic manners let's say uh, not necessarily reflecting about the context and this is what I find interesting when I like to come back to Halim for example in the way he was engaging with this is totally different ways and I think the, yeah this is really like something I'm thinking about a lot uh, this is not a new way of doing, I would say, it's more a way that was not really listened to before and that was not really dominant. And uh, talking about them, for example, the, 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 the perspective I come from being interested in this music is, of course, my own Cameroonian heritage, but also someone else that was interested in this music is uh, Francis Pepe, that is a uh, Cameroonian musician. He was also a musicologist. He wrote one book about African music, uh, trying to give uh, African perspective to, to be able to talk about this. And for him, what was an uh, important aspect of this music was communication. And I wanted to, that we look at this video together of him. I see time is running, I will uh, rush after this. Uh, but I think it's interesting. So he's talking about the bamboo flute of the pygmies and what is interested in it and is demonstrating the technique that is using uh, from it. It's a bamboo flute Wait, playing only one note. One second. It's a bamboo flute playing only one note. That's, that's the only note you can get out of that flute. But the pygmies who are uh, the inventors of this flute are clever people. And I'm, um, I'm glad to tell about the pygmies around the world because when I was um, a boy, a little boy, they, they taught me that the pygmies were savage people just because they live in the forest, which isn't true. You know, it's not just because you live in the forest that you're a savage man or a savage woman. Uh, savage people, to me, live elsewhere than in, in the forest. You, they usually live in cities. But this is another problem, another, another question. Uh, the pygmies have invented a, a fabulous musical technique or instrumental technique, which consists in having a conversation when, with their own instrument. You know, the, 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 the technique is very simple, but someone had to, to find it out, and they did. You, you, you ask the, the flute to speak to you, and the, speak, the, the flute says something like and you, you reply to the flute by saying and all the music you can make with this flute is a conversation between man and his own musical instrument. I think this is interesting. 
and I, uh, and the land is uh, and, and, and point, pointed out because not not everywhere in the world you can find this characteristic uh, of music production. Uh, for instance, I, I can play. Using the same technique, you know, I'm teaching you how, how to do it. You should pay me uh, <laughs> for teaching you. And I use, usually beat my, I, I mean, I'm who made the train? And these trains are not even what they used to be. They have no engine. Oh. past the end because uh, it's basically continuing playing and uh, the time is running but uh, I wanted to play this video because I yeah I watched it many times some more I, mean, I, I like his work uh, a lot and uh, I think he's uh, saying a lot of interesting things uh, what's interesting also is that I found that a lot of people focus on the part where he's uh, explaining these techniques but in this video, he's actually saying a lot of uh, things a little bit uh, I think in a subliminal way uh, maybe because he knows uh, his audience or something like this, but as you maybe notice at the beginning, he's saying how um, I've been told that there were savages. Uh, of course, I mean, I, maybe, of course, maybe you don't know, but uh, Cameroon was uh, colonized by France and um, uh, the UK. Um, and it means that also when you grow up there still, as actually you're still kind of learning um, French history and actually also just to, to give you maybe another of idea the time of colonization is not so far away like for example my own dad or uh, my uncle's uh, aunts etc they were born at a time where uh, Cameron was still colonized um, so this is what is I think this is why he's interested in relooking at this from an, another perspective that is not this uh, colonial perspective. And also there's this moment that I thought about a lot uh, in this video where this train is passing by and then um, he's saying, who built the train? And uh, I thought, I mean, this is my interpretation uh, because I know also he worked a lot uh, with this question and this is what I see in this video with my background to show you that there's, always different layers of things happening. I think maybe he's talking about the train or saying we need the train because uh, before France and uh, the UK, Germany was uh, colonizing uh, Cameroon. And at that time, they, the Germany built the railway or the train in Cameroon. And uh, I know this uh, more for the perspective of my own family because it's a, a story that is known, but uh, uh, Germans were going through the villages and taking young uh, men, like for example, my great granddad was like this, and forcing them to work to build the train. Uh, and a lot of them died, like my great granddad, for example. So I think maybe uh, it could be possibly something he's talking about. And I would like to reframe this question he's asking by, uh, by the way, who made your train? Uh, and you will understand maybe later when I talk about something else why I'm saying that. Um, so after this, I wanted to talk about my radio show, but maybe I will uh, just skip it because we don't have a lot of time yet and I might come back to it later. But I have this radio show on Kashmir Radio, uh, maybe just go on the website and then have a look at the, all the different uh, people I invited and uh, what they did in the show. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe I'm just to make a link with open sources. Actually, I wanted to talk about an article that was published recently on Dweller. Uh, this article, you will find it in the blog on Dweller, where musical personal stories of non-Western electronic. 
uh, that was written by this journalist, Jean-Luc Cabuki. <coughs> the certain point of the article or what the journalist asked me, because I did this uh, episode um, about sound synthesis, sorry, from the non-West. So I don't really like this term non-West, but in this context, uh, it makes sense. It was more a way to uh, emphasize the fact that a uh, lot of people that experimented with, uh, with uh, avant-garde electronic music, sorry, are not part of uh, those official history, just like Halim is just one example among else right now. So I recommend you to have a link, uh, sorry, a listen at uh, the radio show so you can discover all these different art, uh, artists and then read um, the article to understand some of the, the context. And also I wanted to point you toward the fact that there's a lot of links uh, hidden in this uh, text that is underlined here. Uh, and I wanted to emphasize this because I want to talk about one article that is in there and I think that is really interesting to, to read if you're interested in sound and is related to the question I was asking before. Um, so a lot of this article after presenting some composers is talking about some of the historical context in which the pioneers that are well known like Schaeffer, etc., were working in, in because it was also like the end of the French empire, etc., and they were totally tied into this. And I think this is something important to point out in any kind of histories to not just uh, point at personal biographies or, you know, like uh, single out some uh, geniuses, etc., because there's this broader context that explains why certain uh, figures were more um, had more attention than others, and why uh, it's. I mean, from a material point of view, it's uh, mostly because of uh, access to technology, etc. And why one article that I think interesting that you will find uh, at the end. Uh, of this part here is uh, this one that I recommend you to read, uh, Nimble Fingers in Electronic Music Rethinking Sound Through Neo-Colonial Labors. Uh, I think this article is really gives a really interesting perspective uh, for sound studies right now. Basically, it's about the fact that um, trying to rethink this history of electronic music that is talking about the popularization of electronic music with Moog, et cetera, and uh, emphasizing the fact that this popularization is possible because of the, uh, all the sinking costs of this uh, equipment is possible because of a neo-colonial labor, which means like they talk about uh, transnational some contracting. So basically at this moment, a lot of, uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, companies started to uh, have, uh, sorry, what's the, the, to produce abroad, mostly in the countries that are known as Global South. And I think uh, this is interesting, like she's pointing out the fact that a lot of the theories, like for example, I was thinking of this theory, I don't know if you know it about it, uh, it's called the the Walkman effect, for example, uh, this is something I learned about in Sound Studies. Uh, the fact that, uh, I, I mean, the fact that the Walkman is uh, allowing you to have this like one to one experience, giving control over your environment, etc., which, by the way, was a theory that was a commercial one. So anyway, uh, this article is pointing at the fact that, in fact, this experience is the experience of the customer that is at the end of the chain and this experience is co-produced by the people that are working for uh, or that are exploited in the factories that load to create these uh, cheap technologies. So I'm not going to dwell much more in that, but I, I really recommend you to read it because I think it really gives a lot of uh, possibilities um, of rethinking all these histories. Um, <clears throat> so I talked about that. I have 10 minutes left. So what can I talk about during those 10 minutes? Uh, I, we're going to talk about quickly about a last um, 
project of mine. And then I will introduce during the time I have less, just a few figures that I think uh, are interesting for you to know about. So this one is called Tribute to the Whistle. It was, uh, I was invited to do a composition as part of the work of uh, Natasha Sudo Appelman in the German pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2019. Uh, so this is not, the whole thing is not my work, but I want to talk about it because I think it's relevant in this conversation. It was actually an important experience for me um, because um, maybe I should talk, uh, yeah, start talking about the context. So her installation was called Anchor Centrum and it was making reference to those anchor center, center in Germany, which are places where uh, refugees that don't have uh, legal status yet are kind of trapped without uh, legal status and there's police abuse uh, taking place there, etc. cetera. Um, and this, the, the sound installation, the sound installation part, the tribute of the whistle was a reference to the fact that they uh, self-organized there with whistle, um, because the whistle is a sound that is not really, it's quite loud and not really nice. And it was a way for them when they were like uh, gathering together and whistling uh, to drive the police away. I hope I explained it well. And uh, the piece I've done was only with the sound of the whistle. Um, Maybe I will talk about the, 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 the piece itself afterward, because I think what was important about the, the well, what influenced me about the context was that uh, in her way of working, she saw much further than just uh, displaying a theme in the Venice Biennale itself. Uh, for example, the, the German foreign minister is coming uh, each time to open the, the Venice Panil, uh, the German pavilion, sorry. And she wanted, this is why she called it anchor centrum because she wanted to uh, symbolically have the German foreign minister open an anchor centrum. And uh, I thought this was quite a uh, strong thing for her to do. And also she was really aware actually of the context she was in. Um, she really paid attention to uh, the, the, where the fundings were coming from, because when you have a pavilion, then you need to find your own fundings. She was uh, attentive to also the all the world context of the Venice Biennale, which is basically a, the origins are a colonial exhibition. Not every country is there, etc. And some uh, countries have much bigger pavilions than others, etc. And also she was pointing out that the fact that, for example, and I think this is important to think about when you work with this theme, it's not only about showing this theme, but for example, in this exhibition that year, there were a lot of pavilions that were about community, decolonizing, etc. But during that time, for example, the people that were cleaning the German, uh, the Venice Biennale were mostly migrants of color, actually. And uh, I think this is something you really need to think about when you work, what is the context you are working with? Is it only discursive or are you paying attention to the whole structure that is behind? Um, yeah, okay, 10 minutes. So I'm going to not talk about my own work. I've done more there even though it's related. And then I'm going to present just a few people. Um, mainly in Indonesia, because this is where I've spent some time. And uh, so I know a little bit about it. So there's this initiative that is called Musa Sonic that I was part of. This is a network of uh, different uh, curators in Southeast Asia to, yeah, uh, to try to uh, shed light on the discourse there on different uh, artists, etc. So if you go on the blog of Musa Sonic, then you will find different interesting articles that are written uh, from uh, uh, authors from there that are really interesting. Also, I, I did this residency with uh, Yes No Wave music. So Yes No Wave is a label that is releasing uh, Indonesian artists that are working with uh, mostly electronic music or experimental music. <clears throat> and all of them are trying to uh, have a language that is uh, really kind of particular to Indonesia. Some of them are trying to go against the fact that 
for example, in Jakarta, you have a lot of electronic musicians, but a lot of them are trying to uh, maybe recreate a aesthetic that is more European uh, because this is what is working more, what has more, uh, uh, gets more attention. And the principle of this uh, label is that all everything can be downloaded for free. Uh, so actually, I'm going to play. Uh, I'm going to play it at the end. The video of Walk the Rock, which is the founder of this label, uh, is also uh, an artist. <clears throat> And I invite you to look at this website and I wanted to draw attention to this, for example, this project that is called Parasite Lottery. I think it's an interesting one. He was working uh, in the Leverland uh, with a different uh, art institution, et cetera, to reflect on funding. Uh, and uh, his approach to funding was to put it in um, a relationship with uh, uh, practice in Indonesia that is called Arisan. Um, as you can see here, you can also like research by yourself. It's a form of uh, alternative bank loan or a form of microcredit uh, that are uh, that is done by communities in villages. So everybody is gathering um, uh, regularly. And uh, each person is, uh, one person is chosen to be funded by others, uh, basically. So that this person is able to, as you can see, like uh, uh, undertake an affordable, an affordable business venture, or if they want to do a wedding, a purchase, anything. So it's something like kind of uh, funded by the community. I think it's really interesting. I'm not gonna talk about it more, but you can research about that. Um, and it's interesting to think this way about the structure of itself, of funding, of art organization, etc. Um, yeah, and uh, part of these labels is, uh, if you know them, sorry, I don't know if it's here, uh, Senyawa. They released first on this label, and uh, I want to draw attention to this project that they just did, which is kind of the less decentralized way of re releasing music. So they released the album, and then they gave this music to 40th of label worldwide and really in the world, not only in the West, so that each label can release the music, uh, inviting uh, artists uh, from their community to do their own take on that, uh, graphic designer from the community to uh, kind of uh, show their approach from their own uh, point of view, etc. So I invite you to have a look at this. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I'm not going to be able to talk about. The last person maybe quickly I wanted to talk about is George Lewis that you will encounter in the article on Dweller, but is an important person for this kind of talk. I invite you to read this article, New Music Decolonization in Eight Difficult Steps. Uh, and uh, to also have a look at his project called Voyager. There's an interesting article from him, but it's called uh, Too Many Notes. Uh, I don't have it here, but uh, you will find it um, linked in the article of Dweller. And it explains how uh, he built this uh, algorithm of Voyager from his own Afro-American perspective. Uh, so maybe there's just three minutes left. Uh, maybe we can just, uh, I don't know, finish with the, a little bit of this video from Walk because I didn't have the time to explain um, what was the concept of his label. So maybe just the beginning of that, three minutes and then. I want to play music. Gonna be the love. There's no if it's a non profit music label. I mean, like, it's, this is very, you know, it's a popular image. It's really for a uh, follow for, for political, political activism, action, or something. Free download. <laughs> like, free speech, free download. <laughs> I mean, like, free download, it means, like, uh, it's, it's sharing knowledge. That's the idea. It's not stealing. It's not only free of charge, but free to distribute.
free to remix, free to share. My name is Walk the Rock. I'm an artist. My practices are very cross disciplinary. Music, visual arts. It's a collection of young people's favorite album. So I make a form online and people can submit their favorite music. Like the title, their names, their profile pictures, and then their commentary, why they like the album. And then I download it on the internet, like using BitTorrent, and then I burn it on CD, <laughs> like this. Yeah, it's the idea is to is represent how technology changes, how people listen in our listen into music or how people get get music and then also like the identity. Okay, I'm gonna stop here because it's uh, almost uh, one hour now. But uh, just find this episode. This is made by Subtropical Asia, which is uh, actually a platform I think mainly based in China uh, that is concentrating on Southeast Asia. So I wanted to finish on this also because I think it's important to also have the voice that of people that are doing interesting things uh, that are not based uh, in Europe actually. Thanks. There's no conclusion because those are ongoing thoughts. So I'm ready for if you have questions or comments or anything. Thank you so much, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was really interesting, and also of course that I, I feel we will you barely scratch the surface because it's. Many. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe if you could share all the links like somewhere, it would be interesting for us. Yeah, maybe I can send them to you per mail and then you send it to everybody or something like that. I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think it's uh, still possible. So maybe there should be an archive or something. Yeah, thank you so much. So we have some questions here uh, from, from a chat and I will uh, read some of those to you. But uh, yeah. First of all, thank you for everything. It was really interesting. And I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the whole world of music we didn't know that just really lies beyond the Western tradition of everything. And I really appreciate that you made this thing like the genius and talented things are just a construct. It's barely a social construct, which is yeah, made my money. Okay, so uh, a first question will be like this. Uh, one of the main theme in post-colonial discourse regarding non-Western culture relies on technology. It is technology that turns out to be the emancipating instrument of cultural and political liberation. Don't you think that there are problems in this approach that need to be taken into account? And uh, rather a small comment, we must remember the fact that technique and mediality are never neutral, but somehow belong to one or another force, whether social or political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with your statement. Actually, this is kind of what I was always trying to point toward, no? And so technology, uh, it's not only computers, etc. But uh, in the case of statistics, for example, it's a form of technology as well. Um, yeah, of course, you don't have to see it from this point of view. But as I, this is why I, w I made the point to say at the beginning that I was speaking from my point of view as an artist, also not a theoretician, but also as someone that is actually doing computer music, sound art, etc. So technology is at the center of what I do. So this is also why I'm kind of alighting this, but actually for what you're talking about, this is why I thought this uh, video from um, Francis Bebe was interesting because actually it's kind of subverting this idea of technology saying, oh, this flute is a uh, great uh, technology. Um, yeah, so, I don't stir to this, but I agree that uh, you can see it in a lot of different ways. So I don't have to take this route. It's just mine. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, 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 at least three questions. <laughs> uh, people interested in your, uh, like, it was. So, I mean, most of, in most of my work, I'm using Max MSP. So actually a lot of my thinking was influenced by the interface itself. I think it's worse to, to say, because I think it's an interface uh, that is 
once you get away from the timeline, like so if you're not working with Ableton, etc., then I think uh, it allows you to think about temporalities in a different way, or at least I want to see it like that. Uh, so maybe I can just, uh, how much time do we have left so I can show my screen and just show something quickly in Max MSP? Or? No, I still have like some time, so don't okay. worry. Um, so Max MSP is the software here. I heard that a few of you are going to have an introduction. <clears throat> so when you open Max MSP, you start with a blank page. And I think this is interesting. I mean, of course, the software itself is also, uh, it's not so transparent, actually. This is an illusion that you start with a blank page. It's, it has a certain vocabulary, etc. But let's say it's much more open than uh, when you have an interface that is already coded. Um, and for me, uh, what is also interesting with this is that you, um, it's really easy to get out of this uh, 12 tone equal temperament uh, type of music that uh, is kind of the default, uh, at least in this part of the world. You can really easily work with other type of uh, scales. I can show you how to do this. So the principle of Max MSP is that uh, it's code, but you have objects, so little kind of bricks. It's kind of a uh, uh, sorry Tetris game. So bricks that you link together with with chords. So for example, if I have something like this, DAC, this represents my audio output. This is going to be left and right. And if I send something into it. Some objects have already interfaces. This kind of interface, you know, this is a gain. If I would link it this way, and if I would send sound into this gain, then you would be able to visualize it in here. And then if I do this, I would be able to uh, control the volume of what's going in. So there's different objects having different tasks. The task of this one is is to, or the function of this one is to be the audio output. The function of this one is to be the gain. And to work with a non-equal temperament, then you have different ways of doing it. I'm just gonna show you the most easy way of doing it, which is using an object called, uh, sorry, not cool, but call, which is an object that stores data. If I double click on it, I have a window opening and for instance, let's say I want to load a scale. I'm going to put whatever. Also, like in, in Max MSP, you, you think in frequencies in general. You don't think in terms of notes. You have the whole frequency spectrum available to you. Uh, so for example, if I put this frequency like that, and then whatever else, and this, and then that, like that. And then for uh, that, okay, this is now my list. Oh, there's a problem somewhere. Anyway, uh, anyway, you will have a list like this in the end and you can recall each of your notes by recording the, So if you know already a little bit Max MSP, this is all you could load in your own scale and we really recall it by any way you want. Um, another thing is also that in Max MSP, you work a lot with an object that is called Metro. And this object is important. I mean, this is at the base of what I've done in my, um, the album Multivocal. So a Metro is metronome. It's not only this, it's something that can trigger events. So you think in terms of events in Max MSP. And this metronome, it can think in terms of musical terms. So I can think in terms of eight notes, stuff like this, but I can also think in milliseconds. And this is very interesting for me because it means that you can work with some kind of rhythms that are outside what you're able to notate in um, the score, the classical score. But also, and this is what is happening in the case of uh, multivocal, the changes, the tiny changes that are happening, it's like changes every milliseconds. So it's even 
under the threshold of human perception. And uh, this is also really interesting for me. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, I, I recommend you to just explore the possibilities of those two, this is like the beginning of many different things. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope it was clear. Thank, thank you for, for this small introduction. Uh, there's another small question. Um, like, is there any other software that anyone could use where, which is not like, you know, which is not strict, which is not strictly limited to this, to the, uh, yeah, to the Western way of making music, like uh, besides uh, Max MSP, which is really works well in my opinion as well, because it's like a blank slate and you can, you know, mm. whatever, it's like horizontal, but is there, is there any other, other software maybe, because Max, you know, that it has some uh, difficulties to approach it for the people who just know nothing about like visual programming and programming mm. as well. It's a bit, bit complicated, but then maybe, you know, maybe there is an easier way to step up for the non-Western music production, otherwise not using Ableton Live or not using anything like, like this. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, uh, another way of coding is Super Collider, but uh, I think it's more complicated than uh, Max, actually. Otherwise, I mean, there's someone like uh, Ria Malami, for example, is working on this uh, project that is called Apotome. Let me find it. So uh, this is a software that allows you to work with microtonality when you work with MIDI. So you can, if you work with Ableton Live or uh, something like that, then you can um, uh, wait. You can use MIDI with any kind of scale you want. Uh, so this is on this website. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the kind of thing you were thinking about. Uh, this is Lema, and uh, the other part is called Apotome. And in this one, you can select a tuning system, uh, do your own. Uh, it works in the browser, and then you can send MIDI infos and easily work uh, with other type of scales. Um, what else? I mean, I don't know. I mean, even though, like, uh, yeah, just to talk about again about the fact that Max is this blank state and of course it allows you to do a lot of things. I mean, you know, like programming is still in the English language, for example, uh, and actually it shows because I was thinking about this last time that because I learned music in French, the only notes I know is like do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. I don't know ABC, stuff like this, you know, or I don't know eight notes, things like that. So whenever I try to think in musical term in Max MSP, I don't really know what is eight notes and all this kind of way of thinking. So uh, it shows, uh, I mean, anyway, any type of uh, uh, technical production always shows the community of thoughts in which it was produced, which is something that, uh, um, George Lewis is talking about really well. Uh, another thing that you notice, I, I never really thought about it, but I just thought about it now, that one of the long standing uh, uh, samples, examples like a sample li in the sample libraries of Max MSP that you have is the voice of this Native American man there. I think there is something to really reflect about there. It's really interesting because yeah, I mean, it was created at Ircam, but uh, it's basically uh, by an American person, etc. So I wonder if someone wrote about that. So sorry, I didn't totally understand your, your uh, sorry, answer your questions. I mean, I know a lot of people are just uh, also working with free softwares, something you find a lot, and just doing their own thing, like just uh, reappropriating this uh, open source free technology as well and doing it their way. So. I think in in any case, whatever you're using, you always have to confront yourself to someone else's fault and someone else's uh, limitations. So, yeah. There still was a proper answer, and uh, probably uh, if there's nothing else. We'll have just one more last question, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which is about your yeah, like your probably French and uh, South African or French heritage. Uh, so the thing is that uh yeah as, as as a person who's grown up in france 
you probably know, of course, about them. You mentioned the music concrete and uh, everything related to Kiesch affair. And then somehow, so if you read these like diaries or if you read all the, the books he published, two two books he published actually, <laughs> as far as I remember, uh, you see a lot of things that first he was really uh, into this mood to revolutionize the music production, to revolutionize the musical composition. And then in the end, he becomes disappointed in, in, in this in a way because he thought that what he's doing, like what, what, what he's done with uh, Musique Concrète and then later with Musique Cosmatique is not actually, is, is, is not actually music, so to, 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 his, to his opinion. And then uh, how, how do you think that uh, does this, uh, the, the, the music that we don't actually think that it's music or most people don't think that noise music, for example, is music or it's just pure noise for some people. Don't you think that it still has any emancipatory potential or like, I mean, the, the weird music, everything weird, everything which is not related to, you know, to the um, known itineraries, to the known methods of music production, which has no notes and notation as well. Do you think it, it has something to do with the emancipatory potential or does it still have it? Uh, I don't know. I think it has a lot of things to say about this. I don't know where to start. Maybe like the first thoughts I have is that, uh, I mean, sometimes this emancipatory aspect can be really uh, illusionary because a lot of those pioneers we're talking about, as I was saying before, a lot of their emancipation is really just discursive, no? And it's really just about aesthetic uh, exploration and trying to break uh, off the Western way of seeing music. And you see already there that the way they did that a lot of the time is by appropriating other music that is non-European and for them it's like revolutionary. So I'm always cautionary with this idea of the new, like for me I'm not interested in something new, I'm just uh, doing something personal, I think it's more meaningful. And also because if you read this article afterward you will see that, um, or oh, if you research about that, that uh, it's, uh, you need to understand French context as well, because the way this history about Jerem was told is that there are left wing uh, against Vichy, etc., like kind of um, resistance. And then all this uh, colonial aspect is totally erased. So it shows that this emancipation is happening at the expense of someone else also. And you will see also in a lot of their discourse, there's a lot of stuff that are, I mean, it's just a French racist and colonial mentality that is like kind of underneath that. Um, yeah, so, and this is why I think when I was presenting, I was trying to always draw attention to this structural part, like in the Venice Biennale, for example, what does it mean if you have all these supposed emancipatory pavilion about decolonization and then you still have migrants that are not well paid that are going to clean after you, you know? So I think this is the important question to ask. Yeah. I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you for your answers and thank you for your talk. So <laughs> we're happy that you joined us again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Very fascinating. So, Thank you everyone that you joined us as well and I see some heart emojis in the chat. And <laughs> I was, uh, that was really funny that some kid, right, it was a kid who just thrown himself into the, the Zoom conference and was drawing some stuff on the screen. I think it's also... Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> Zoom bombing. <laughs> okay. it happens. It's okay. <laughs> sorry for this. I mean, it somehow put you in the first person. Sorry. That's yeah. all right. <clears throat> thank you for everything and thank you for joining us online. See you in a bit. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.